Welcome, everyone, and thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us for a webinar on steel process optimization and automation with thermal monitoring. This presentation will be given by Andy Beck, president and co-owner of Viper Imaging. During the webinar, if you have any questions or comments, please use the question pane that's been superimposed on the right-hand side of your screen. The question pane we will look at throughout the webinar We'll answer a few questions throughout the webinar, and then we'll take time at the end of the webinar to answer any questions that are remaining. So I invite you now to sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee, and we'll get this show on the road. Andy, over to you. Thanks so much. Uh, appreciate the time today um, uh, to, to talk to you guys about a few different things that we're doing in our business. Um, just to kind of give you a little overview of who we are and uh, what Viper does, we'll, we'll kind of go through that on the front end. Uh, Viper Imaging, uh, we founded the company almost 10 years ago. Um, uh, myself and Rich Shannon, my business partner, uh, really trying to find and fill a gap or a void that we saw in the industry. Uh, FLIR has always made great products uh, going back uh, for many, many years. Um, we work with those products over time um, and, and they're fantastic for what they do. Um, what we saw was a gap between those products and the actual application of how do we cross that bridge to get the two together to where you have reliable systems. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today, how we've done that, what we've done. Um, but just uh, again, a little more in our background, our team is based out of Birmingham, Alabama. We cover really the world uh, out of here. Um, and we, we specialize really in the heavy industrial space. Those are the applications we know really well. Those are the applications we've been around for over 20 something years of our uh, industry experience. And, um, and as a result, we've kind of become, if you will, the dirty, nasty guys within FLIR. So if there's a dirty application, a, a rough application, that's where we're kind of called in to, to get how things, see how things work, see what we can do to provide some solutions for that. As part of that, we're in obviously the steel industry, we're in the metals industry pretty heavily. Uh, as you can see from some of the images below, I mean, we are still involved heavily in the utility market, uh, oil and gas, petrochem, some wood products, those, those type of applications. Uh, so that's where we spend most of our time. That's what we're doing um, as far as a company goes. You know, we, we try to take it as a, a pretty holistic approach uh, to uh, us being the sales organization that we are. We realize that one, we want to be a partner. Uh, with our customers, you know, we want to we want to make sure that we understand exactly what's going on uh, within your facilities, so that we can provide or not provide, you know, what's best uh, for the application. And, and our our goal for that is to integrate, you know, things that are cost effective yet being incredibly impactful. And and we want to make sure that these are the three core things that we're after um, when we're helping a customer. You know, we're we're looking out for the people, so safety is probably the utmost concern. For a lot of the systems that we're doing, uh, we're looking for the uh, for your equipment. You know, basically, how can we increase productivity? How can we make things last longer? Um, which all that translates into uh, more profitability for the company and a better uh, better position for the companies uh, that you all represent. So, what we're going to walk through a little bit that's uh, that's a little bit about Viper. Uh, we want to talk about the technology and how it's used in these industries. Um, so, thermal imaging has always been a very unique. Uh, method. It's a great way of quote unquote, you know, seeing things in a different light. Um, you know, however, in the past, we've been able to, we've been somewhat limited. You know, the cameras themselves are pretty expensive. Uh, they didn't last very long. The amount of data you got out of them wasn't really that great. Um, so that, that's, it's where, you know, we, we've had to deal with that over the years. But there's been great enhancements, great advancements in technology over the past really uh, 10 years to help change a lot of those parameters. And we'll go through those um, today. You know, and I think it's really unique in that right now, you, you're you all being forced to have less and less personnel in and around areas, and you're gonna require more and more data, more and more visualizations. And thermal monitoring is really set to bridge that gap um, as we move forward. Um, so some of the things that uh, we try to do, we our software that we have that we'll talk about this later is called Viper Vision. And when you pair those FLIR cameras with Viper Vision, it does allow you to get a lot more of this information. So there's really three key things um, in working with any system. Um, one is the visualization itself. You know what what do you want to see? How big is it? How far away is it? How hot is it? 
how cold is it? What are these different parameters? So you have to make sure that you have the right camera in doing that to make sure you get the right visualization. Um, and then once you have that in, there's there's a control function uh, for these cameras while they're in the field. You know, before, not long ago, and we'll talk about this in the next slide, but you know, there were cameras that didn't have quite the functionality. There's a lot more control, a lot more things that we can do with uh, controlling the cameras, monitoring the cameras, being able to manipulate uh, what's going on inside the camera while it's in the field. So that's very important. And then really the biggest thing and the highlight of this slide is the communication. You know, cameras don't really matter. You guys don't wanna buy cameras, just have cameras. You don't wanna buy one more thing just to maintain it. But you do need that communication of data. So it's really critical to basically, to be able to go back through that visualization, through that control and communicate uh, the information effectively, uh, you know, communicate the, the, the best information, the information that you want. Um, and, and more importantly, in the means that you want to be able to consume that information. Um, and we'll talk through those details uh, here in the next slide. So next few slides. So let's start with the camera itself. Um, I showed some cameras down here below. These may be some cameras you guys have had experience with in the past, the old FLIR A series and A basically stands for automation. Um, so, you know, as you, just as a step back, you know, FLIR has a lot of portable cameras in the industrial market space. Um, these automation cameras have advanced quite a bit, like I said, over the past few years to where they use the same detectors, the same cores, the same basic components inside. But, it's, you know, how do they interact? How do they work um, uh, to get you the data? So there are some pretty unique things in here as far as the, on the bottom right left that the AX5 cameras, those were gig vision cameras. So they're very limited. They're more for machine builders, not so much for that heavy industry. Um, and then the 615 next to it was more of an R&D camera. That's, so we had to deal with a lot of those R&D spaces. And then the A310 on the bottom left was actually the workhorse forever. Uh, we've had that camera out there for 10 or 15 years. Um, and it's been a great camera. However, it's just gotten dated. I mean, there's a lot of things that it just didn't do that the new series up top so you've got on the top left is what we can they consider the a50 or a70 series and then on the top right is the a400 500 700 and we are going into the minute details FLIR has some great information on their website about that but you know the main thing is that the main differences between these two i should say is you have different resolutions in each series so the 50 you know, has a resolution of 464 by 388, and the, the A70 has a 640 by 480, so higher resolution cameras. So again, these are almost all higher resolution cameras than what's pictured below, or what we've been used to, at least in the A310 series. It gives you a couple different options as far as being able to have systems that work with the application that you need. So again, I've gone into a little bit too much detail on this, but at the same time, just know that like the A50 series, the one on the left, is typically going to be a lower temp. You still have a much higher temp than what you would have in a previous series, but it doesn't have a, a remote motorized focused, for instance, and it won't go up to 2000 degrees C, which is everything that it'll do on the right side camera. The nice thing is, though, that FLIR has designed these cameras where they have the same detector and the same connectors on the back end. Everything's the same. So these are now power over Ethernet cameras, so they're a whole lot easier to, to integrate. They both have optional visible cameras, so you've got a visible camera built into them. So it's just some neat features that have come about with these cameras to, to give us a little more, uh, a lot more options as far as uh, where we're going to put these cameras and what we're going to do with them. And that's that's fine and great. Uh, so that's these are base, the basis of what we're doing uh, for sure. Uh, the real hard part though is, you know, how do you make these cameras live in your applications uh, for more than a day? Um, that's been a real learning curve for us over the years. Um, what we're showing here, these are our Viper Venom uh, series enclosures. We make them in a few different sizes based on the cameras that we're using there. Um, we use some, we use these for visible camera applications as well as thermal. But you know, these are rugged, ruggedized, um, anodized aluminum systems that uh, do really well in most most applications. Uh, not pictured on here, we do have some stainless steel enclosures, water-cooled enclosures when you have those really hard to meet areas, but we're, we're putting these in and around ladles and other places all the time. And we'll do different things like, you know, it's showing the top right side, a sun, uh, you say, a, a radiation shield to be able to block some of the heat 
that you get from these areas because the ambient heat's going to be high, but it's not as high as the radiant heat in the middle of a floor or something. You're going to be there. Um, the featured in the bottom is one of our systems that we use. It has an air inductor to, to basically blow a large amount of air when you have these really uh, dirty, nasty places that you're going to put these to because you want to keep those optics clean. So a few different options on keeping the system alive. That's really key. So, and then the third part of the, the three-legged, what we use as far as the three-legged stool for our applications is the software. So in the software itself, we have ViperVision Max. This is just a, an image of someone's uh, control room to where you're able to see multiple cameras at one time. You know, we can control all kinds of things on there as far as uh, what you're seeing, where the measurement tools are, uh, things like a graph uh, that, that, that can give you some more visualization. Uh, there's a lot that you can do there. There's a lot of things on viperimaging.com where it shows the details of this, but the ViperVision system allows you to control multiple cameras and more importantly, to get that data and run it over into your system itself. Uh, one of the unique things, and we'll talk a little bit about this, is this report in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, we can do a, a, a weekly report, if you will, on like label health. And that's one of the things we're going to talk to. So you know, as we're sharing information with your control system through a medium like OPC, you know, we can get the ladle number and be able to track that temperature over time and create a weekly report. That's some of the systems that we do. So, so you know, the system solution itself is allowing us to basically, this gives a little architecture of what the camera, how it communicates with various control systems, with uh, security systems. One of the unique features of those cameras themselves, the new FLIR cameras, A-series cameras, is they are um, dual streaming. So you can have, if you will, a means of talking to our software, to talking to ViperVision, as well as a third-party software, like a VMS system, for instance. So if you've got, you know, Convergent, Milestone, Vigilon, Genetech, you know, you, you can actually stream that information right in just like a security camera. So you're still doing the control, you're still doing all the alarming, still doing all the communication through the ViperVision system, but you can have a dual uh, stream to ViperVision, or there are some, some built-in parameters on those cameras as well, as far as REST API and some digital IP, IP uh, excuse me, digital IO, if you need that at the time. And then, you know, what this shows is, again, through the Viper system, whether you're using OPC or Ethernet IP or DMP3 or all these different types of communication capabilities, you know, the, the idea is you want to be able to have those to communicate with your control system. So a lot of those are built in there. So if you want to have everything from a rate of change to a an over temp alarm to whatever, those, those are different things and options that you can have in that system. So uh, just to go through a few different applications, um, you know, there's a lot of things, a lot of areas that we work in in the system itself, everything from the Coke plant to the AOD, BOF, electric arc furnace. We're gonna look at a couple different applications, they just those highlighted, but we're gonna look at some ladles and then uh, water wall leak detection as far as the applications. So uh, the, we did a case study with a customer um, that basically went through the large integrated steel mill a uh, thousand employees, a good size place for sure. They have an annual forecast about 900,000 tons, uh, a large area to cover a lot of different things going on within this application. And what we're looking for is basically the ladle refractory monitoring. Uh, camera's been using this a lot of time for a long time. What we were doing was trying to automate that as much as possible. This is what led to our reporting function that I talked to before. And the reason they were doing that was because they were trying to figure out you know, what they were doing, they weren't able to get the right information. They had guys going out, one, you're putting people out on the floor, personnel in, in harm's way more than you should to be able to shoot something with a handheld uh, pyrometer or even a handheld imager. Um, those were pretty inconsistent results. You know, they're doing some visual inspection. There's, there's always the, the information that you guys have and the knowledge base that you guys have is huge and we wanna make sure that um, that's just enhanced by using a consistent means of, of monitoring, which is what we're doing. Well, there's other ways to do it, laser temperature measurement. We work in conjunction as well as all these. So I'm not saying that this is a be all end all, but this is a huge proponent in being able to make sure that we see everything that we need to see. So 
in this instance with this customer, they were saying a production loss was about $15,000 a minute. So I mean, it's, it gets to be very significant. A lot of you are, are probably in that same boat as far as, you know, uptime is the, is the largest um, key parameter that you guys work against, that you're paid against, that everyone works towards. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that we're part of keeping the uptime going. You don't want any unforeseen uh, issues or uh, problems. And uh, what we're trying to do then is look through and find what when you have refractory that is degrading so that you can plan a little better. One is you want to make sure that you use the ladle as long as possible. Get as many heats out of it as you can. At the same time, you don't want to have, you know, a breakout that's catastrophic in a lot of different ways. It's, it's going to cause you to have to stop doing what you're doing, an interruption in that process, which increases or which decreases your plant uptime. So, uh, for instance, this is a, an example of a hot spot that was seen as it was going by, it was coming into the, the region of interest that we had drawn there for it, uh, they were able to alarm off of. Uh, this is this, another one that's showing, someone just sent this in to us recently of, hey, while you are able to see that thermally for sure, and again, this is a screenshot of the, um, of the, of the computer, so that's why it's a little degraded. You know, they, they can actually see it visibly as well. You want to catch it well in advance of something like this happening for sure. But what we saw when once we implemented the, uh, our refractory, ladle refractory monitoring system was uh, a pretty impressive uptime. We were at 98.6%. The last time they had told us about everything and and that the the investment was a very quick payback uh, based on those so key benefits in in all of this and looking at these ladles i think the biggest that we're going to keep focusing on is, is safety for sure uh but through the prevention of of those metal breakouts you really get to enhance what you're seeing on the ladles as far as increased uh, lifetime uh, or the right life, you know, the right lifetime that you need to have on it, and that's going to all turn into that plant uptime, which is the biggest, which is the biggest one that we've, uh, the biggest parameter that we're gauging there. So, the other case study that we want to talk about, and this has become a little more prevalent over the past couple of years, is water wall leak detection. So, you know, you've got a lot going on in an electric arc furnace. Um, the cooling water system is very important. Obviously, you have to have that back in behind. Uh, the refractory, but you need to make sure they're preventing leaks. And you've got a lot of water running through these things, you know, four, four and a half gallons a minute per square foot. So, I mean, that that generates a lot of water. That's, you know, what are we saying? 4,400 to 6,300 gallons a minute. And and why that's important is, as you all well know, water and steel don't mix together very well. So what happens when, if you get like um, some water entering the AF, it does start to boil, you get some some vapor coming off of it, but there's also a reaction that happens. So that reaction can produce uh, hydrogen. And as well as if you get water entrapped, you can have a secondary explosion or a singular expl explosion that then hits that hydrogen and, and you get a, a pretty massive issue. So what these images are showing here is some of those water wall leaks that show up. Now, again, that water is going to be much cooler. So you're seeing these cool areas, which is the black area that's shown on here. And they're able to easily detect, easily see where, or one, that there is a water leak, which is um, very hazardous, but also determine where that source is coming from. So that when you do have to go do any repairs uh, or anything on the turnaround, it makes it a lot quicker to know exactly where that's coming from. So these are some pretty powerful images that actually show what that looks like when that's getting in there as far as a progression. But again, the key benefit for this one is definitely safety. You know, it's what's happened is, through a couple of the incidents that we've had over the years, um, you know, more and more companies are moving more and more personnel out and away from the electric arc furnace. They want to make sure that they're as far away from harm's way as possible. And that's going to require more and more remote detection. Again, these thermal imagers show very well what, what's going on in and around the system. Uh, we work with operators all the time to make sure that we can, one, figure out where to place them. That's that's really the hardest place is, you know, a lot of you guys don't have sky hooks out there that you can just put them wherever. But, you know, we work to make sure that we put them in the in the the, the best place that we can to be, get the greatest view possible in those systems. So um, just to show a couple other applications, you know, um, we are looking at around the electric arc furnace. Refractory monitoring is obviously the easiest one. There's a lot of different places to look for refractory based on your application. Uh, every application is different. That's why we started this thing out. We want to make sure we partner with our customers to make sure we understand the application, to make sure that 
we know exactly what's needed. You know, for instance, if you have a, a guy who's, uh, you know, trying to do a little burnout using an oxygen lance and he always manages to go a little heavy in one spot, then that's a place that we probably need to look a little more intensely than somewhere else on, on a refractory line vessel of some sort. And then other applications around, you know, the torpedo cars for sure, anything that's carrying molten metal, again, anything where there's refractory, there, there's a lot that's going on now inside the ladle to be able to see, hey, do I have some different striations that may show poor laminar flow, um, you know, slag detection, all these other things that are going on actually inside. Again, the, the A700 and 500 cameras are great for these applications and that they'll go up to that higher range of, of temperature. For sure. So uh, that, those are the two main, or those are the applications we kind of talked through in the steel industry. Just one more that is the basis really of where a lot of the thermal imaging came from. And, you know, don't sleep on this application. And that is, you know, being able to monitor um, the power coming in. So you guys all have transformers, you all have substations that are very important to make sure that you have a camera monitoring that real time. There's a lot of other applications you can use, but it's a fairly inexpensive way to look at your substation. As, as you go through. So these are some of the different application areas around um, the steel industry. We're always finding new ones I and mean, we've been doing this for 25 years. And, and yeah, every time we go out, we find a new uh, application from you know, all over the place, whether we're looking at billets and measuring the temperature to you know looking at a sanding camera and we're looking at that application. So you know, we're happy to, to let, take and look at all these applications. Uh, we want to make sure that, um, you know, that the right technology is used in the right place. And with our partnership with FLIR, they have the right base modules that really get us to, to be able to provide these, these applications as they go through. So I think now we're going to take some time for some questions. And, um, you know, again, uh, we want to be able to talk to you and answer any questions that you may have uh, as we move through this. Um, this period. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. Just real quick, before we get to the questions, uh, for those individuals that have joined the webinar late, we do have a question pane that can be accessed from the right-hand side of your console. If you'd like to ask a question, feel free to go ahead and type it in there. We'll get to those questions in just a few minutes. Okay, Andy, it does look like we have a few questions in the old question pane here, but before we get to that, just real quick, uh, just a quick announcement, folks. I know you've been on the webinar for a little bit. We do have a, a survey at the end of the webinar, if you wouldn't mind just taking a couple extra minutes, fill it out, you know, let us know what type of content you're looking for, what's interesting to you. That way we can make sure that we're, we're getting the type of information out to you that you're looking for. So Andy, one of the first questions that we have in the question pane is how how does alarming integrate into other systems? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think uh, what we covered a little bit in there and we threw a lot of terms that the folks may or may not know, but, you know, using your SCADA systems, PLC subsystems, whatever you use it for control, they usually take that information in. You know, we can do in old school ways, everything from just a digital relay that says, hey, I went over a temperature or over some analysis that we have in the software. Um, for instance, you know, you could say, hey, I've, I've drawn a region of interest on the screen. And once I hit, you know, 60% of this over a certain temperature, then I want to fire a relay. And it could be something as simple as a relay coming through. Um, typically, what we use is just a little cleaner and easier for install is uh, something like OPC. Uh, so OPC is a, a communication protocol that speaks with most control systems and, and you can get a lot of data across there. Not only, uh, it's just a lot easier to do that. So it's, it's, it's something as simple as writing a tag in your system that we then uh, talk back and forth. So those are the, the, the big ways that we do it. Everything from a hardwired solution through some IO modules. Uh, there are, as I mentioned on most of these cameras, there are discrete outputs on the cameras themselves. Um, and uh, then the OPC or other type of communications, Modbus, whatever it may be, to your control system to get that data in. And, and you can do those at the same time. So you can have relay relays as well as uh, the digital communication. Excellent. All right, uh, next question we have is uh, in regards to thermal cameras. And the question is, um, which thermal cameras uh, are right for this application? 
Yeah, that's something we just kind of barely touched on. And that's one of the things where we can help um, in the conversation is, you know, the main drivers are going to be temperature of the object that you're looking at. So, for instance, um, the A50 and A70 cameras from FLIR, um, they're only rated, they're only calibrated up to um, 1,000 degrees C, so 1,800 degrees F. That's that's great for most refractory monitoring applications, but you don't want to use that for looking at a poor stream or something like that. You, know, you would need to then go to an A400, um, 500, 700 series. Those go up to either 1,500 degrees C or even all the way up to 2,000 degrees C in the case of the A700. So that's the main driver is having to have uh, having to know the temperature of what you're looking for. The other has to do with optics. Um, so you know, how big of a field of view do you need to see with one camera? Obviously, you want to try to get, um, you know, you want to use as few cameras as possible uh, to save cost. So you, you want to go as wide of an angle. But if you're trying to see a very small spot size, um, depending on the application, you know, like in the substation application, you know, you can't just put one camera looking over the whole substation yard because you won't be able to see something as small as a bushing. Uh, that's actually going to monitor that you're trying to monitor. So there's things like that that um, that you've got to uh, go through. But most of it is based on the temperature that you're viewing on the camera, and then the optics uh, that are involved and needed. Excellent. All right. Next question we have is in regards to licensing. So how is Viper Vision software licensed? Yeah, so it's done a couple different ways. Um, we do it, the camera's sold on a per camera basis. So however many cameras you have, there's a license fee with that. But we do it either on a yearly basis, um, which basically gets you all your updates. It saves a little bit on the cost. Uh, but we do offer a perpetual license as well. So you buy it one time, you own it. You don't have to do anything with it. It is all on-premise software, so it's not cloud-based. Um, so everything there is on site. Um, there are some web servers that you can use for communication in between, but um, uh, yeah, that, that's a couple different ways we do it. Excellent, excellent. Now listen, we only have about three minutes left, so I'm gonna try to cherry pick uh, some of the questions out of the question pane. So apologies to anybody. If we don't answer your question, we will reach out after the webinar to continue answering questions if you type them into the questions pane before we end the webinar. The next question that we have is in regards to the data storage from the Viper software. And the question is, uh, is the data recorded in a SQL database? We can export the data uh, a, a few different ways. I mean, there's a simple Excel <laughs> file, but you can also do a CSV dump. Um, and we do work with SQL databases to be able to, to, to move that information over. So yeah, there's a few different ways to do that. Uh, based on the information you want. Again, you can get the whole image and every pixel in there, but a lot of times you're talking 300,000 or more pixels. So uh, that's that's a lot of data, or you can just get the small reads of interest. Uh, but yeah, we can continue, we can work with the SQL database to, to dump that information over. Excellent. All right, next question we have here is for substations. How do the cameras and PTZs work with electromagnetism and solar heat? Yeah, that's a that's a great application, and that's something we've had to work through. Um, we 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 use sun shields for the most part on a lot of the cameras themselves. Um, depending on the application, if it's some really hot areas, we've even used some um, uh, cryogenically cooled camera housings to make sure that we maintain the temperature of those cameras to within the specs uh, that are required. So uh, that's something you have to definitely take into account is the solar loading. Uh, on that, um, and then the EMI as well. I mean, everything we've got is, is it's not completely hardened, but it works in most of those environments. There's some really heavy DC stuff that, that we have to do some extra shielding and stuff on. But for the most part, you know, the pan and tilts themselves, um, as well as the enclosures and the cameras are all pretty well um, shielded from that. Uh, they work pretty well in those environments. Uh, and just as a note, the pan and tilts themselves, you know, when you put those in a substation, they're capable of running a route. So it'll go on a predefined route. I mean, you can take a joystick and move it um, however you want it to, wherever you want it to, but for the most part, it goes and it looks at, you know, 20 different assets and it, it and will stop there and say, hey, what's the temperature? Is it higher or lower than it was before? Uh, when you have any, on any of these applications, you can have it to where it'll send an alarm via an email as well. So like in the substation, like, hey, this, this bushing's heated up over the past, four days, we need to take a look at it, so. 
Excellent, excellent. Uh, listen, I, I think we've got time for one more question. We're just at the top of the hour, so I just want to be cognizant of everybody's time and, and appreciate you all hanging on here. Um, so, Andy, maybe I'm going to let you take this one. If you want to take a quick look at the question pane, maybe just grab the one that you can that you can really touch on the most, and then we'll we'll end it on a high note. Sure. Yeah, I think one of the first ones that came across was basically. Um, <laughs> Probably the question, which is, uh, you know, they look, you know, a lot of you guys look at these applications, but the hard part is where do you put a camera? I mean, again, I mentioned that before. We call it a sky hook. Everybody just wants to say, if I could, I would stick it right here. You know, when we're looking at water wall leaks, for instance, there's not a lot of great places to have the camera mounted in a lot of these mills that isn't, um, you know, isn't like in the middle of the air. So we have, what we do is we have to work within the constraints, what we're given for sure. Uh, but at the same time, because of the flexibility in the cameras, we can use different lensing to move the camera further away. So while it, you know, if you may want to see something that's 40 feet wide, you know, you have the capability of moving that thing maybe 100 feet back and still getting a good image, still seeing the data that you need. So a lot of times we'll move things further back than they are and just use a telephoto lens. Uh, with the amount of energy you guys are working with a lot of this stuff, that a lot of these times it, it, it doesn't really matter. You still get all that information. In. So that's uh that's probably one of the one of the questions I saw in there and and again yes we we are putting these in steel mills so all those enclosures are you know we we have a conversation with almost every customer to make sure that we're providing the right environmental uh, protection uh, for the application itself and then one other thing that's on there is uh, do you want to talk about the um, uh, about this presentation being available later. Yeah, I think Alicia just answered it in the question pane for those that are looking for it. Uh, Alicia, did you want to come on and just give a, a quick note on that? Sure. Um, yes, we will. We are recording the presentation. Um, so following this, we will send an email containing a link to that recording. Uh, probably not today. Give us a couple of days, but we will definitely email that out. So thank you. Excellent, excellent. Um, Andy, appreciate everything for the webinar. Folks, thank you for hanging on. Uh, we do have some extra questions that are in the question pane, not to worry. Apologies that we didn't get to them, but we will answer them shortly after the conclusion of the webinar. So again, thank you for your time today and have a great rest of your day.